Okay, now, uh, moving right along in Steiner, uh, his commentary on the Gospel of Mark. I don't have the actual physical text of Mark uh, here. I'm reading an electronic version. Um, and this is, uh, don't get confused, this is lecture number three, uh, or rather, my discussion, uh, video number three, but lecture number four here in, in Steiner. We discussed lectures, his first two lectures in part one, and the second in part two, and, uh, and third, and now we're up to the fourth. Um, so what Steiner does in this lecture is to discuss and contrast the differences between the Buddha on the one hand and Socrates on the other, and then Christ uh, sort of in between them as a kind of synthesis of, the, of their two respective methods. And he starts off by talking about the Buddha, and he says that the Buddha represents, um, what he talks about is the, how to achieve uh, samsara, that is to, nirvana means to blow out, like blowing out a candle, blow out the soul and all of its earthly attachments and to get out of uh, the wheel of rebirth, out of samsara. Uh, you don't want to be born again. Um, and the lessons that he learns under the Bodhi tree, and he describes the Bodhi tree as the Bodhi tree event. Uh, so in a way, it's analogous to another tree, the, the mystery of Golgotha, which he calls the Golgotha event, which is the mystery of another tree, Christ hanging on the tree there. Um, and that's a sort of just as Christ is the second Adam, so that tree is the second tree, um, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of immortality uh, that we eat from uh, through taking the communion, the wafer and the, and the wine. Um, under the Bodhi tree, then, the Buddha experiences, uh, and this is dramatized in that uh, movie, Little Buddha, Bernardo Bertolucci's film, where he experiences the three temptations, comma, first, desire, uh, three beautiful young women, uh, that represents past, present, future, desire, fulfillment, regret, desire for something, the future, having it now, fulfillment, and then regretting it afterwards, the past. Um, so that doesn't move him. He's sitting in meditative posture. Uh, and then uh, Mara assaults, attempts to assault him with an army. He's not scared at all. That's fear. So he's not moved by either fear or desire. And then there's a temptation of Dharma there as well, his duty. Why isn't he out doing his duty? Uh, as a prince. He has res responsibilities. He shouldn't be sitting here meditating. Um, so none of those, he's completely unmoved by those. So nirvana then consists in the attainment of a psychological stance that is indifferent to these kinetic motions, either toward or away from something. So Siner just sort of briefly encapsulates this, um, and then he gives an example of the way, look at the way in which the Buddha speaks to his pupils. He speaks to them through uh, images. Uh, he talks, for instance, about uh, to one of his pupils about how um, the soul should neither be tuned too tightly uh, nor too loosely, uh, but something that is in between, uh, so that reason can relate to the mind in a way that's not, uh, it doesn't go to extremes. Everything is the middle path in Buddhism. Um, so he says, so he wants to make the point that the Buddha then is speaking in sort of these images uh, to his disciples, whereas now Socrates, about 100 years later, across the board, um, is using reason, logic, uh, to sort of teach ordinary, everyday things using logic uh, and the appeal to reason. And he wants to pull out of you how to think for yourself. What he's really doing, uh, as Eric Havelock remarks in preface to Plato, is that he's teaching the individual how not to think uh, in terms of the oral tradition where wisdom is just handed down in the form of proverbs. So you just spout back. Socrates will grill somebody on the street What's wisdom? And somebody will just spout back, well, it's a proverb, a, a cliche. That's the oral tradition. But in the written tradition that is just coming into being, um, writing is detribalizing the individual, breaking him free from these kinds of passing along of oral tradition through rote memory and instead getting you to think for yourself as an individual. So it's a detribalization sort of process that's taking place. This is according to Eric Havelock. Um, but it's the upshot of what Socrates is doing is using logic to get you to think for yourself. So the way in which Socrates teaches his pupils is strictly using the methods of logic uh, and geometrical proofs, let's say, to get you to think for yourself. Um, so these are the two extremes. The Buddha sort of bringing down the lesson of the heavens to the earth and Socrates using logic to teach earthly things and teach you how to think using uh, the intellectual soul, what Steiner calls the intellectual soul. Um, now he says, uh, in Christ's method of teaching, he teaches one way to his audience uh, and a different way 
uh, a little more esoteric way to his pupil, to his close disciples. Uh, and he says, look at the, in the Mark gospel, the parable of the sower, where Christ tells the crowd, and this scene is depicted very awkwardly and uncomfortably in uh, Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ by Willem Dafoe, um, who may be the worst uh, actor ever cast as Jesus Christ. <laughs> nothing works in that film as far as the casting goes. Actually, nothing works in the film <laughs> uh, other than the sets. That's about it. Um, the parable of the sower, um, where a man is sowing seed and some of it spills onto the road. He sows some seed, some of it falls onto poor soil and sows some seed into thorn bushes and then sows some seed into good soil. Um, so he tells this parable to his audience, but then later his disciples want to know what he was just talking about. He says, well, this, he translates it into concepts, the intellectual soul, in other words. Um, well, the birds picking up the seed, people hear my word. The word is the seed that I'm sowing in their hearts. And um, the birds who pick up the seed are the, it's the, uh, Satan. Uh, and these individuals are e easy prey because it, it never w rooted in them in the first place. Anyhow, the ones upon whom the seed fell in poor soil and then a plant grew up very quickly, flowered, withered and died are the sort of fair weather people who receive my philosophy, but they don't, when trouble comes, uh, they don't use it. They, it doesn't, because it's not rooted in them. And the one that, the seed that falls in the thorn bushes that chokes uh, the plant from coming up are the people who hear my word, uh, but they get sidetracked by the, the temptations of life, riches, lust, uh, money, uh, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for them. Uh, the seed, the word that falls on good soil, that's my seed. That's my word. Um, so Steiner wants to draw your attention to the fact that here we have Christ sort of in between these two, where the Buddha speaks in these sort of imagistic uh, mythical messages on the one hand, as Christ does to his audience. Um, but on the other, uh, he speaks like the way Socrates does to his pupils using concepts. So uh, it's sort of a synthesis, sort of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, um, that happens with Christ. Now, um, so Steiner has this idea. What he wants to do is relate these three to three different epochs of history. Um, and as we saw in previous lectures, uh, he connects his post-Atlantean epochs, and there are seven of them. We're up to the fifth now, uh, to developing one or another aspect of his subtle bodies. We have the physical body that we share in common with minerals. We have the etheric body that we share in common with plants, but that also has to do with memory. And we share an astral body with animals, which has to do with waking consciousness in the presence of a nervous system. And then we also have the ego, uh, which he really means the soul, the, the individual personality and the human soul within it. Um, and then above that, we have the spirit self, life spirit, and spirit body. Um, but the soul itself can then be broken up into the sentient soul, which perceives in terms of images, uh, like dreams. It's a kind of dreamlike way of perceiving the world. Uh, the intellectual soul, which is self-evident, and the consciousness soul, uh, which has to do with using one's will, freedom of the will, to effectuate uh, things on the physical plane, tasks, events, and so forth. And so he says that uh, the first post-Atlantean epoch was the Indian epoch, and their task was to develop the etheric body as a, as a culture, as a cultural whole, to develop the etheric body, which indeed I think they did, um, because the etheric body has a lot to do with memory. And uh, the fact is that India is a prodigious feat of memory uh, because writing didn't come very late uh, in that civilization. Uh, mostly uh, around 600 BC, but it was mostly for practical purposes uh, until when the British got there, they started interviewing all these wandering sannyasins and uh, committed to writing uh, the different recensions of the epics and the Puranas and uh, all the sacred texts, the Vedas. Um, and they realized that they were all pretty much in agreement with each other. So they have uh, preserved their traditions, their myths, their epics, the Vedas, the Upanishads, through incredible feats of oral memorization. A little bit like the ending of Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury's novel, where uh, once all the books are burnt, the only thing you can do is use memory. So it reverts back from a literate to an oral tradition uh, in which each individual has to memorize the entire text of a great novel. Jane Eyre, let's say. Your task is to memorize Jane Eyre line by line. And that task is going to require a prodigious feat of the etheric body of, of the memory. Um, and the etheric body is not just memory, it's spiritual powers that organize uh, the physical form. 
um, it's kind of a lot closer to Rupert Sheldrake's idea of a morphogenetic field than to just personal individual memory. Um, so it's like that. Um, the, the, uh, the, the feat that India performed. Um, and then we have the, the development in the second of these civilizations, or post-Atlantic cultural epochs, as he calls them, with Persia. Uh, their task is to develop the astral body, uh, bringing conscious waking awareness to the struggle between the two principles of the god of light, Ahura Mazda, and the god of darkness, Angra Mainyu, and performing good deeds in the world to work toward a restoration. Uh, the world is, this is the myth of the fall that originates in the West, comes from this. And then he says, so the third post-Atlantean epoch is the Egypto-Chaldean Babylonian epoch, or let's say the Egyptian and Mesopotamian. Uh, the archaeology was still coming in from Sumer at this time, um, or not even just barely. It's not actually until the 1920s, uh, and this, this is 1912, uh, this lecture. Um, so, and in this epoch, we have the development of the sentient soul which has to do with perceiving the world in terms of dreamlike images, i.e. myths. And so uh, that's the Egyptian, the first generation of high civilization, we might say, using Toynbee's uh, designations of three distinct generations of high civilization. The first one is pre-philosophical, we might say. Um, neither Egypt nor India developed uh, the intellectual soul. Uh, neither Egypt nor Mesopotamia developed the intellectual soul. Uh, but once we get after those Indo-Aryan invasions that take place, uh, as well as the peoples who invade China. They are racially not Indo-Aryan, but culturally pretty much the same thing. They're riding in chariots and their warriors and they're conquering as they go along. Same basic thing all happens during the second millennium from 2000 to about 1200 BC. Uh, it creates the Mediterranean Dark Age with the chaos of all the sea peoples and the collapse of the Hittites, uh, all the uh, Ugarit, the Canaanite world, almost Egypt. Egypt was really the only civilization that to survive this period of total chaos. But it's in this second generation of civilization that we get um, the philosophical traditions in each of these civilizations, China, India, and they happen at about the same time, right around uh, the 8th century, uh, 800 to 500, right in there. Uh, this becomes Karl Jaspers's axial age, which goes across the board. He gives the dates 500 BC to 250 BC, but I think it should be expanded to more like 800 BC to include the Upanishads, which signify the shift in India, starting with Yajnavalkya, who is the first of these types of teachers. And all of these individuals, whether we're thinking of, um, maybe not Confucius in China, but certainly Lao Tzu, or whether we're thinking of Yajnavalkya teaching the new technique of meditation, yoga, as his name implies, to the Brahmin priests and saying, no, 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 enlightenment does not consist in just pouring butter into fires. You have to meditate and discover the unity of the soul the individual micro soul, the Atman, with the macro soul, Brahman, and realize the Brahmatman, they are, you are part of this single gigantic uh, field of energy, Satchitananda. Um, and then so we get, of course, Pythagoras and uh, Socrates is part of this, as well as Plato, all of these teachers of self-salvation um, that are going on here that signify the advent of what Steiner indeed calls the, the epoch of the intellectual soul the mind soul that's beginning to come on stage here. And uh, so he sees, um, so we've got then uh, to recapitulate with the Egypto-Chaldean, we have the development of the sentient soul, according to Steiner. And then with the fourth of his post-Atlantean epochs, the Greco-Roman epoch, which is at the sort of nadir of his V-shaped arc, we have the development of the intellectual soul, the mind soul. And then for the, this epoch comes to an end for Steiner, uh, as the arc of the V begins to ascend into the fifth epoch, consciousness soul, uh, which comes into being uh, right about the time of the Renaissance, which has been the task of our Faustian civilization to bring into being. And the consciousness soul has to do with the intellectual soul is already in place and can be taken for granted by our epoch, which now adds the sort of development of the consciousness soul, which has to do with freedom of the will. Um, free will is, is a primary attribute uh, that comes along with uh, the events of the ego and the individual that the Golgotha event uh, brings into being with Christ bringing this emphasis on individuality into being. And this epoch, ours, uh, has developed a consciousness soul. Uh, that has been its task and purpose. Now, Steiner makes us a mistake here. Um, it's a pretty big one in that his characterization of the Buddha, um, he says that the Buddha re represents a continuation of, into India of the sentient soul that is left over from the third epoch, which would be his third post-Atlantean civilization, 
Toynbee's first generation of civilization, namely Egypt and Mesopotamia. And he's carrying this on. Uh, this is why he speaks in parables, whereas Socrates is, of course, preparing the way for the coming of the consciousness soul. Uh, he's a, both men are embedded within the epoch of the intellectual soul that's being developed during this fourth post-Atlantean epoch across the board. But the Buddha is preserving the sentient soul, uh, which is incorrect. And it's a, it's, a, it's a big incorrect because Buddhism, the origins of it, is fundamentally and totally nihilistic. It's precisely the images of the sentient soul that the Buddha is blowing out, like blowing out a candle flame. There is no soul. There is no Atman. There is no Brahman. None of that matters. Only Nirvana, uh, which eventually leads to the concept of Shunyata, the void, which is uh, morphologically homologous to Atman, uh, but it's not analogous. It's got totally different connotations and they're nihilistic. Um, so he's blowing out the very thing that Steiner thinks that the Buddha is preserving within the epoch of the intellectual soul. Uh, he says he's sort of keeping a warm glow burning of the mythical, what Gene Gebser would call the mythical consciousness structure. That's totally wrong. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, Spangler has this idea that he's inherited from Nietzsche of the Socratic man. Uh, the Socratic man uh, and the Buddha are morphologically analogous events with respect to their individual civilizations that represent the beginnings, the earliest beginnings in each of these respective civilizations of nihilism. Uh, Socrates with ration, using rationality to sterilize uh, tradition, uh, to get rid of piety, uh, to question, 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 question everything. Uh, and this is the, the negative side of the intellect where instead of it becoming a helping force, it becomes a liability because you end up, the more you overthink something, the more you kill it. You basically destroy it and it eventually will lead to st stoicism, uh, and um, which is equivalent to, uh, in our civilization, according to Spengler, socialism, which is also nihilistic, in nihilistic, at least in origin. Now, it may be right that Buddhism, when it enters into its later period with the Mahayana, does indeed bring back the sentient soul and combines it with the intellectual soul. Uh, let's say it combines Nagarjuna with all of his logic chopping and his emphasis on uh, shunyata and uh, the idea that there is no distinction between nirvana and samsara since they're both essentially the same thing. You don't have to renounce the world, just participate in it with a certain inner detachment and awareness of that void that's there. Um, and then all the gods come back as bodhisattvas. So the whole thing lights up with uh, a new profusion of Buddhist myths and myth making. So the sentient soul is brought back, but the Buddha was most definitely exterminating it and wiping it out. He is the Socratic man in India, the beginnings of Indian nihilism. Uh, so Steiner has this totally wrong um, about the Buddha. He belongs into the age of Karl Jaspers's axial age, which is going on here from around 500 BC to 250 BC. It terminates, according to Jaspers, with the creation of the three different empires uh, after the Carthaginian Wars lead directly to the creation of the Roman Empire and their conquests uh, sort of brings it to a close in uh, the West. Along with, uh, in China, we have the formation of the Qin Dynasty under Qin Shi Huangti at about the same time as the Carthaginian Wars are going on, uh, which creates the universal state there in China. And then Ashoka in India at about the same time is creating a universal state there. So we get that puts an end to the axial age with the creation of each of these three respective empires across the board. Um, it could be pushed further, though. I, I, I think that Christ does have, um, in, in a certain sense, he's coming out of the tradition of the axial age, although uh, I think it is kind of uh, a dying age that is behind him, uh, as we see in when Steiner's talking in the fifth gospel about Christ uh, as a as a young man wandering around Palestine and realizing that the oracles are going silent, as it were, the prophets there, in other words, are going silent. They're losing the, the great voice, um, the muse, Sophia. Uh, they're, they're no longer hearing it, and people have become infested with demons. So it's a little bit like that. Um, so, But he is right, I think, about Socrates um, anticipating the comings of the consciousness soul, uh, which is the epoch that... that Steiner's fifth post-Atlantean epoch that we are entering into, did enter into right around the year 1400. And it's interesting to compare him with Gene Gebser because Gebser's model, uh, 
uh, is compatible with Steiner's in, in quite a number of ways. I think that Gebser has the magical consciousness structure as the first ab sort of aboriginal consciousness structure um, where magic and rites and exorcisms and black magic and rituals and so forth all comes out of that. Then with the mythical consciousness structure uh, that overlaps with the, the Neolithic, the later Neolithic, and then the first generation of the high civilizations, um, that more or less what he means by the mythical consciousness structure, which is a thinking in terms of images, uh, is basically what Steiner means by the sentient soul. And the Egypto-Chaldean civilization or the Egyptian Mesopotamian civilization uh, developing the sentient soul is essentially the same thing as Gebser's mythical consciousness structure, just as his epoch of the fourth post-Atlantean civilization, the Greco-Roman developing the intellectual soul is the same thing as Gebser's mental consciousness structure, which he sees coming in, of course, with the Greeks. But it also goes across the board with Jaspers's axial age, with all these great individualistic thinkers and philosophers, as we have seen from India, uh, China, India, and across through Persia as well uh, to the West. Um, but it's interesting that um, I think that Steiner does, in the shift from the intellectual soul, which is the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, to the fifth, to ours, of the consciousness soul, 1400 is, is pretty much a watershed. And in a way, I think Gebser should have developed two different, two different consciousness structures here, uh, one for the intellectual phase and one for what Steiner is calling the, our epoch, the consciousness soul epoch that begins with 1400. Um, because Gebser does, because for his model, he has simply the mental consciousness structure from the Greeks down to the end of the 19th century, where we get a new consciousness structure the integral consciousness structure, which is a perspectival in terms of the arts. Depth perspective had come in during the Renaissance, right around 1400, and everything before that in the arts, uh, Gebser says, is pre-perspectival. So he does recognize that there is a hinge within his overarching mental consciousness structure, where we have the Greco-Roman version of it. In the arts, it's pre-perspectival all the way down to the year 1400, uh, when we get the perspectival or late phase of the mental consciousness structure. And I really think he should have divided that into two separate consciousness structures, the way Steiner has done here and brought to illumination for us with his two epochs of the fourth, the Greco-Latin uh, cultural epoch, which develops the intellectual soul, and then ours starting right around the year 1400, uh, the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, which develops the, the age of the consciousness soul. There really are two different epochs there. Uh, so Gebser's model doesn't, it, it should have made a distinction there between those two. Um, and so that's it. That's the upshot of uh, this particular chapter, Lecture 4 of Steiner's uh, Gospel of Mark.